The bus pulls up. The doors open. Wait in line for your turn to board. Swipe your card. Tap your phone. Drop change into the fare box. And then move back to hopefully get a seat. At your stop, you get up. Push your way to the rear door. Wait for it to open. Keep waiting for it to open. Does the driver know you're waiting to get off? Excuse me. Um... Oh god, the front door is closing now. You're gonna get stuck on here. Rear door! Rear door! Finally, the sweet relief of exit. If you ride buses, you're probably familiar with the steps to this little waltz. For most riders in North America, at least, this is the ritual. With the exception of a few specially designated bus lines and a handful of forward-thinking cities, Almost all buses require riders to board at the front and exit through the rear. But why is it set up this way? Well, because that's where they put the doors. Front door boarding may be the most common practice, but it's far from the most efficient. The metric that best illustrates the inefficiency of front door boarding and fare payments is dwell time. Dwell time is the amount of time that a transit vehicle spends stopped and waiting for passengers to either board or alight. The following formula, DT equals 1.31 plus 2.573 times BA can be used to calculate the total dwell time of a bus at a stop in seconds. In it, B is equal to the number of boarding passengers and A is equal to the number of alighting passengers. For your practice question, what is the dwell time for a bus with 8 passengers boarding and 4 alighting? Dwell time makes up around 10 to 25% of the total time a vehicle spends on its route. Limiting boarding to the front of the bus creates choke points and having all passengers exit through the rear door does the same. In New York, the M15 bus received a select bus service upgrade that allowed for all door boarding and spent about a third less of its time stopped and total route time dropped by about 15%. There are additional flaws. One in particular has come to light during the COVID-19 pandemic. Having riders board and pay at the front puts drivers in contact with every single rider. At the beginning of the outbreak, cities removed fares and sealed the front doors and instructed riders to board at the rear to protect drivers. The practice put drivers at risk before COVID-19 too. In many cities, Drivers are instructed not to enforce fares after other drivers have been attacked or even killed over disputes around non-payment of fare. It's not a coincidence though that the entire country pretty much uses the same layout for boarding buses and paying a fare. The modern bus layout comes from the end of the streetcar era and there are two reasons for its creation, fare revenue and labor. Early history. I did a video in March on the history of streetcars. It's the first of a two-part series that I haven't finished yet. If you haven't watched it, I'd recommend checking it out to get more context around things I'm going to talk about in this video. The earliest horse-drawn streetcars, horse cars, were operated by a two-person crew, a driver who handled the horses and a conductor who handled the people. Passengers usually boarded from a platform at the rear and conductors took on a similar role to train conductors. They handled fares, made change, and alerted the driver when it was safe to stop and start. Having two crew members was a safety feature. Cities in the 1800s and early 1900s were chaotic. Streetcars, horse carriages, pedestrians, and automobiles all shared the same uncontrolled space. Streetcar operators had to be prepared to stop quickly, and brakes were much more cumbersome and could take time to apply. This practice carried through to cable cars and then electric trolleys. A typical arrangement was called a double-ended car, where a streetcar would have doors at both ends and in the center. The driver operated at one end while a conductor typically had a station at the opposite end and would walk the car collecting fares. When reaching the end of the line, the driver and conductor would switch places and then run in the opposite direction. Managing the constant flow of passengers boarding and alighting was tricky and conductors on busy routes may struggle to keep up with issuing fares and making sure that all the passengers were properly ticketed. 
The early 1900s is when the first changes were made to how passengers board and pay fares. Fares were locked at five cents for decades across the United States. And so when costs, particularly labor, started rising, streetcar companies began looking at where they could shore up their losses. The first item was lost revenue from unticketed passengers. To address this, the pay-as-you-enter system was developed. Streetcars were converted from double-ended to single-ended. Passengers could no longer enter through any door. They had to board at a rear platform where a conductor was always stationed to collect fares. Passengers would then exit through a front door that was next to the driver. Pay-as-you-enter resolved the issue of non-payment, but conductors still handled the entire fare payment process, and streetcar companies were suspicious that conductors were skimming fare money. To address this, the first change was implementing the fare box. The earliest fare boxes were simply a locked box that the conductor sat next to. Conductors kept issuing tickets and made change, but they no longer handled the bulk of fare money, which satisfied suspicious management. The 1915 Peter Witt streetcar refined pay-as-you-enter into pay-as-you-pass. A flaw with pay-as-you-enter had been that boarding from rear platforms increased dwell time as riders had to wait in line to step aboard and pay. In pay-as-you-pass streetcars, passengers boarded at the front into a small prepayment zone. This moved the conductor and fare box up near the front, although farther back than modern bus layouts. The prepayment zone was small and without seats. To move to the back to get a seat or to get to the exit only middle door, riders had to pass by the conductor and pay their fare. Labor. In the early 1920s, more changes began taking place that shaped modern transit vehicle layouts. Shortages of labor during wartime drove up labor costs and ridership losses to driving tightened the finances of streetcar companies. Fares still couldn't be raised above five cents, and so streetcar companies turned to labor as a source for cuts, and the position of the conductor was in the crosshairs almost immediately. Fare box advancement had been cutting into conductors' responsibilities for a while. Newer fare boxes could perform tasks like making change, and this left conductors with fewer and fewer responsibilities. Conductors were still employed for safety. The prevailing public mindset was that having two crew members was safer because conductors kept operators free of distractions. In addition to collecting fares, conductors were responsible for letting the operator know when all passengers had boarded and when it was safe to move. A pretty significant number of streetcar incidents involved passengers trapped in doors or being partially outside of the vehicle that started moving, so this was still an important task. The preference for two crew members was so strong, though, that some municipalities passed ordinances banning single crew operation, and transportation unions often lobbied against conductors' positions being cut on the grounds of safety. The first attempt to break the two crew standard was the Bernie safety car. Bernie safety cars were a low cost mass market streetcar designed to be put on low traffic routes for cost savings. Bernies were double ended with a door to the right of the operator station. Fares were collected through a pay as you enter fare box system by the operator and the rear doors were set to exit only. To ease fears around single crew operation, the streetcars were equipped with new safety features, hence the name safety car. Bernies had a dead man control. If the operator removed their hand from the controller for any reason, power would be cut and the trolley would come to a stop. Doors were connected to the throttle and braking systems. The trolley had to be stopped for the doors to open and the doors had to completely close to start again. While Bernies were unpopular with riders due to their cheap construction and poor ride quality, streetcar companies used them to show that new safety features could make single crew streetcar operation safer than older two crew streetcars. Single crew operations still faced resistance from organized labor. Efforts by streetcar companies included paying operators of single crew streetcars 
more than the same position on a two crew member streetcar or conceding to only letting go of conductors on retirement. Conversion to single crew operation was slow. By the early 1920s, less than 10,000 of the nation's roughly 50,000 streetcars were operated by one crew member. Standardization and Bustitution In the 1930s, an entire generation of streetcars was at the end of their operating lives and in need of replacement. To handle the upcoming mass replacement, streetcar companies banded together through an industry organization called the President's Conference Committee and commissioned a design for a standardized streetcar. The resulting mass market car was named simply by the initials of the committee that created it, the PCC. While designing their new vehicle, streetcar companies took the chance to finalize the removal of conductors. If the entire fleet of streetcars was built without a position for a conductor, then there would be no room for unions to negotiate. PCCs were operated by a driver that had simplified foot pedal controls that lessened their distractions so they could also manage fare collection. Riders entered at the front, paid into a fare box, and exited through a door in the center. This is the layout that would stick for the remainder of the century. It was finalized when PCCs hit the street in 1937. Municipal prohibitions and organized labor opposition was overcome almost universally. Only a handful of cities held out against single operator PCCs. Many single operator ordinances had already been repealed or were modified to add exceptions for PCCs. In Chicago, a custom order was made to add a third door to the rear and keep the conductor's position. But besides that, almost every city was willing to convert to single driver operation. In cities that refused to yield, another approach was taken. After a 1938 ordinance prohibited single crew streetcar operation in San Francisco, the Municipal Street Railway, the predecessor to today's Muni, acquired 114 new buses and converted 11 of its 32 streetcar routes to buses. Buses were not included in the ban on single crew operation, and they were not usually in the same union negotiations as streetcar positions. Other companies followed the same steps. Instead of getting ordinances repealed and negotiating with unions, transit companies simply switched routes over to buses. The cost saving of single operator transit was finally achieved, although never actually saving the companies from bankruptcy and worsening the quality of transit in the process. And our modern bus boarding process was pretty much set going forward. Most of us still board a bus the exact same way that our grandparents would have gotten on a PCC. In the practice question, dwell time is equal to 83.646 seconds. If you had trouble with this lesson, please ask your instructor for assistance. Modern boarding. Okay, that last part is only mostly true. The last decade has seen some change in how we ride. The successor to front door boarding and fare payment systems right now looks like all door boarding and off board payment or free fares. Free fares. The first part, all door boarding is pretty much what it sounds like. You can use any door to enter or exit. All door boarding is common on routes that use articulated bendy buses. Of course, there are exceptions to that. Non-select bus bendy buses in New York board through the front door only, which creates absolutely massive dwell times as the two rear doors are left closed. Further undoing the historic front door layout is off-board fare payment. Riders on all-door boarding systems are generally required to purchase a ticket or activate a pass prior to boarding. That takes us back to square one though. The front door boarding layout was created to enforce fare payment. All door boarding with off board payment pretty much reverses that entirely. Fares paid before boarding are checked by ticket enforcers, which is kind of like a conductor, but minus the ability to sell you a ticket and with the ability to issue citations. 
So like the negative form of conductors. So far, the only major city to institute all door bus boarding and off board fare payment in the United States is San Francisco. All door boarding has been in place since 2012 and studies carried out after implementation found that dwell time was reduced, bus speeds had increased, and fare evasion had actually decreased. There is another way to solve the fare collection problem, and that is to not collect fares at all. <gasps> Transit agencies are not private companies. In theory, they're providing a public service. Their reliance on fares, instead of being fully funded, does force them to act like private companies sometimes and be protective of their fare revenue. But if an agency were to be fully funded, then the whole front door boarding, fare box, kerfuffle could be done away with. At the end of 2019, Kansas City announced that all bus routes would be free in addition to its already free streetcar. <gasps> Without having to pay a fare on board, riders can use whichever door they please and remove the bottleneck at the front. Of course, Kansas City is small, the transit agency has an operating budget of just $8 million, so it's relatively easy to just fund the entire thing. No larger city has stepped up to try out free transit, at least intentionally. Like I mentioned at the beginning, since the start of the COVID-19 pandemic, many cities changed their buses to protect drivers. Riders now board through the rear door and fares were suspended. It's unlikely that this will lead to long-term changes though. Agencies are already reinstating fares after finding other ways of shielding drivers. It will be interesting to see where we go from here. On one hand, agencies have lost out on months of fare revenue and funding from government sources to make that up is uncertain. It wouldn't be surprising if they get more protective of their fare boxes in response. On the other, agencies should be eager to find ways to reduce crowding and minimize contact between drivers and riders which is definitely a strong case for all door boarding and off board payment. Maybe we are on the edge of a major shift in an 85 year old transit practice. Until then though, it's board at the front, exit through the back, and make sure to thank your bus driver on the way out.